Well, thank you for joining us for our latest edition of Viking Views. Uh, my name is Joel Gackle, and I'm the Senior Director of Alumni Engagement here at Augustana University. And tonight's views will point to the challenges that arise in crisis communications and public relations. And we have two guests with us tonight. Jeff Hansen, Augustana class of 1980, is a consultant and the marketing director for Sculpture Walk and the Ark of Dreams. His previous experience included serving as the director of public relations for Lawrence and Schiller, vice president at Fleischmann Hillard, global PR and public relations manager at Gateway Computers. Hansen has worked closely with the award-winning Augustana Public Relations Student Society of America, training new professionals in the PR industry and beyond. Dr. Michael Nitz, Augustana class of 1989, is a professor in the Department of Communication Studies. He's also a Fulbright Scholar whose research interests are in the international media coverage of political and environmental issues, as well as the role of late night television comedy in the political process. He recently received Augustana's Jane Zlotik Research Fellowship Award for work in Norwegian and German media coverage of the US presidential election. He's the advisor of the Public Relations Student Society of America campus chapter and has led several international courses. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. For having us. Yeah, okay, so both of you are Augustana students. So let's start with that. Can you tell us maybe a little bit before that what the journey looked like leading up to when you arrived on campus? Uh, well, I'm a South Dakota kid. Dad was South Dakota Highway Patrol and we moved around a lot for his work. And then I actually graduated from Pipestone High School, went to Gustavus for a year and then I transferred to Augie. And I had a German teacher tell me um, you should teach German. And then my communication professor said, well, don't major in German because all you're going to do is be a teacher. And here I am as a teacher. Uh, and so it was uh, a great time at Augustana. Um, very interdisciplinary, lots of good challenges and got to make a lot of new friends. So it was a good time there. Yeah, I was, uh, I was raised uh, Lutheran and Norwegian. And so it was predestined that I went to Augie. Uh, both my parents went to Augie and aunts and uncles and, and, uh, and I fell in love with the place. So it, while it may have been predestined, um, I, it was a choice I was really glad I made. Okay. And do you both have a person or individuals who you feel like really impacted your life during your time here on campus? Um, first, I would say Michael Fow, um, who has passed away. I remember in 1988, he is a huge Dodgers fan. He was smoking his camel cigarettes as we were collecting data on the Bush Dukakis race. And he was a huge influence on me. Stefan Lotsky from German um, really inspired me there. And then a guy I work with today, John Bart, um, whose office is right next to me. And so those are probably my three biggest influences. I think uh, probably my biggest influence was uh, Dr. Jim Meter, uh, one of my side profs and my advisor, and, and uh, he was pretty young when he came on staff, but, uh, but he, was, he was a good steady hand um, and uh, just a lot of fun to be around and really brought out the, really made you think and, and not in a way that was threatening, but in a way that was enlightening. Oh, and then Elsie so <laughs> in, the, in the cafeteria was unbelievable. Cinnamon rolls to die for. They are legendary. You are not the first or the 10th person who's told me about that, that's for sure. <laughs> so as we start, um, you both carry different roles in kind of the PR crisis communications world. So Michael, you stayed in the academic setting and are helping to lead students thinking about it in their journeys. And Jeff, you moved on and did it for a career. Can you maybe both talk a little bit about uh, where that overlaps and how it diverges? Uh, five letters, PRSSA. It's, uh, we have an award-winning nationally affiliated chapter. Uh, this is basically a student-run firm. And at Augustana, uh, you have to have a professional advisor that is gonna keep you abreast of current trends in the industry. Every year, the students go up to Minneapolis and compete in a competition against schools from all over the Dakotas and Minnesota. Uh, we're, we've won quite a few of those awards, but the neat thing about it where you're talking about overlap is we go to the different firms 
the director of media relations for Target is an Augie grad. We do nonprofits and sports and the students are able to hear firsthand um, examples of crises and other PR situations. And that helps refresh my teaching and knowledge. And then I learned from Jeff that way. And then the students are able to do some of these experiences as well. So. You know, for, for me, the overlap is every time I've had interns and especially working with Mike's group with the PRSSA is they really have some good intellectual curiosity and they'll ask questions that remind me I'm never done learning. And uh, I really appreciate that. I think one of the challenges of the world in which you live or educate is that uh, it seems like people will bring on crisis communications in a time of crisis. What does it look like to prepare for the unknown though in advance? Uh, well, first of all, in terms of teaching this stuff, it's an easy job, it's a fun job because every day I open up the newspaper there's like 20 things to talk about. And that's even without 2020. 2020 has been a cornucopia of good and bad crisis communication. Um, but what I try to tell the students um, is think proactively. Um, if you are doing proper issues management, none of these things should be crises. For example, every universe place knows what happens if there's a pandemic. Every school should have a plan for what's a school shooting. South Dakota, every business should have a plan for what happens in a natural disaster. Um, what happens if there's riots in your town? These are all things that happen in being prepared, trying to think strategically. PR is a strategic management function. It's not posters, it's not press releases, it's a strategic management function that can help you think ahead to help minimize some of these crises. That's probably how I'd answer that first part of your question, so. I think, uh... That's one of the key things is the whole planning process. And, you know, it, it might be uncomfortable to think about, but it, you just got to play the what if game. Because when it actually happens, it's really nice to know that you have a plan in place, you know, as, as a consultant and, and in previous life, you know, I, I would see prices come up and, and it was like nobody anticipated it. And boy, you've just got to be able to anticipate, here's what could happen and, and then plan for, for what that looks like. And it, it's, not, it's not a short process, it's a big process. But when you have your brand and your reputation and your employees and your community, and your customers all at stake, it's worth it. So when it feels like there's a fire popping up everywhere if you're in a large organization or you're in leadership or you are an entrepreneur and you're running your company and whatever might be happening with customers or employees how do you navigate the tyranny of the now the thing that comes up now that seems to need your immediate attention when there's other crises that might be also bubbling oh good good question again you know i go defer back to my previous answer, having the strategic plan in place can help minimize that, but the tyranny of the now, uh, the first and foremost thing you would do in a crisis is express concern and empathy for humans. Um, and you, for example, you really haven't seen that in the COVID crisis really from any leader, but showing that concern and empathy within your company, show concern for your employees, show empathy for them. They're working from home. They might have sick family members. So doing that um, next, engage your employees early and often so that they know what the crisis plan is. What will we do if there's a pandemic on Augustana's campus? They know, so we're ready for the next one, but you're engaging them instead of making them be the last one to know. I also like you know, telling students in class, tell your story. And anybody watching or listening, who do you want to tell your story? The media, your enemy, or you? And so kind of playing offense there and um, telling your story would be good. So I don't know, Jeff, if you have things to add there, but. Oh, I, I, that really hit it right on the, right on the head. But, you know, the other thing that to think about is, is you can get so wrapped up in the moment and the now that you stop thinking about what happens after what happens next. And so 
anticipating, okay, we'll get through this, but then what happens? And then what happens? So you, you can short circuit something, but you could pay a very dear price for doing it by not thinking ahead on, on what, how that crisis will impact you, your employees, your customers, your community. And there's two examples that I, um, if I can add to that, Joel. One is, um, and these are, this is why it's so good to have the academic professional overlap that Augustana has. The first example is, and just imagine you're this person, you are the director of PR for the Minnesota Department of Public Safety. This is a true story. It's three in the morning, your phone rings. The head of the Department of Public Safety has called you. The trooper of the year has just been arrested for selling drugs out of his car in downtown Minneapolis. What do you do? And so she's calling the PR person for help and he's, you know, he's trying to wake up and she turns around and says, well, I'm really sorry for this trooper and his family and I can't believe our drug problem downtown. So he said, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna line up all the Minneapolis media one by one and you're gonna say that to every single person. Uh, when it comes to food and the tyranny of the now there, uh, I always remember Wendy's and the finger and the chili. And um, when I run this scenario th through the students, it's old enough that they don't know much about it. They all want to pay off the woman. Um, and I was like, well, why are you paying her off? Because, well, because we don't want to lose money and this is a really emotional time and we're freaked out. Well, but if you do, a, a, I forget the right word, subpoena on the finger, you find out it's her aunt's finger that she's been taking around to all the different restaurants. So again, having that plan beforehand, um, engaging your employees uh, can be great tips. And I think, you know, to add to that is, is making sure you have all the facts before you go out. And that, and that doesn't mean you're quiet. It just means you're only saying what you know. And, and, and that can change as you discover more and more things. But uh, I, I, you know, the, it opened up so many different things with, with that particular case, you know, and now it led to skepticism. I think Wendy's handled it well. Um, and I don't think their brand was, was hurt uh, other than in the short term, but in the long term, I think they did just fine. Well, let's pivot uh, a little bit to COVID. So um, there've been no leaders who have done well throughout. I think all of us are human. We have our times where we've done well, we've done poorly. What was a time, maybe even since March to now, where you felt like a leader led particularly well in a moment? And then what did she or he do that made it so they led well in that? I was going to say the ones that led poorly, those are pretty easy uh, <laughs> to come through. I think Governor Christie recently, although he's technically not a leader anymore, that stands out to me. This was after he was diagnosed. He um, walked the fine line between the people who say, wear a blankety blank mask and hey, this is just a hoax kind of disease. And I'm gonna paraphrase him here, but he said, um, we should not be locking down. We can do this without having to lock down, but we also need to um, uh, you know, help protect our most vulnerable people. So I would point him out. And the second person I would point out is Dr. Mike Osterholm, he's a leader in the public health field from the University of Minnesota. And he had a nice two word thing of be kind. And he brought this up when it was back to schools. There's no such thing as bringing your kids back safe to school, even in a non COVID time. And he said, there's the teacher who's nervous because she's 65 years old and she might be at risk. There's also the single mom who needs to get their kid back in school because she has to work, she's been laid off and she can't have them stay with grandpa and grandma because they're at risk. So Mike Osterholm and Chris Christie would be two that stand out to me. I think those are good choices. Um, you know, it's really kind of a, it's, it's such a challenge for the leaders, you know, and, and there's an old saying about overreacting and uh, how will you know when you overreact and what's the price if you underreact? Um, I, I actually was pretty pleased with uh, Paul Tenhagen early on. Um, he, he expressed concern and, uh, and took the situation for what it was. And back then, I think we were all very afraid um, and very uncertain 
And uh, unfortunately, that uncertainty is still around, but it's not because we don't know what the disease is. It's because the conflicting messages that seem to be coming out of Washington and Pierre and, and the other state capitals. But, uh, but no, I thought he did a nice job right off the bat in, the, in just expressing how serious this really was. So what does your role look like if you're seated as a communications PR person um, for a politician and say, you're hired by both the state of South Dakota and the state of California? And because it seems to be those are the two ends of the spectrum right now in regards to COVID. Um, what information overlaps to both of them, understanding that politics and optics look different, uh, but what thread would be the same? Well, hopefully strategic management that those governments will have the PR person there has the VP of strategic communication so that it's really probably impossible to have consistent messaging on any crisis, let alone public health, when your communicator, the voice of the organization is not involved with some of those planning meetings. They need to be there and be a counselor and be advising. Um, I think being consistent would be an overlap. You have to be consistent. Um, tell the truth as often it becomes available. Don't speculate or say no comment would be another um, overlap area. And the last thing I would say um, is comprehensive. Uh, there's so much out there right now. We'll look at California, look at South Dakota. South Dakota is not wearing a mask. Look how bad they are. But there's other things that South Dakota is doing for strategies. Um, there's other things that California is doing for strategy. And the research shows that it's all these things together comprehensively that are having an impact. Mike brings up a really good point about uh, the strategy piece of it as a communicator. And so often I've seen, and you'll see that the, the PR person, the communicator is brought in after the fact and they're not at the table. And you know, a good PR person is, it needs to be at the table and, and the leaders need them at the table because they understand what it takes to communicate that those messages out. They can talk to them about, here's what you need to say, or if you don't say this, here's the possible repercussions. And, and I, I think leaders at any level need their communicator at the table with them as, uh, as a moderator and uh, as someone who can give them guidance on how to communicate things out. Often also too, Joel, they should be there to a common thread would be counterfactuals to bring those up. Richard Nixon um, is rumored to have said, what is the lead story on the nightly news going to be if we do this? Or what's gonna be the headline in the New York Times? And I don't think you've seen that with, it's been hurry and play catch up. So if we're gonna say flatten the curve, what does that mean? And once we flatten the curve, then what are we gonna do? Oops, I guess we forgot that part. Okay, now that we've had our lockdown, how long are we gonna do it for? If we have a mask mandate, how long are we gonna do that for? What's the purpose of it? How long will it last? And then what? And you're seeing that in most of the world right now, the countries that had lockdowns, now that everybody is back out again, the virus is increasing again. And nobody really talked about that early on. They said, flatten the curve, okay, we flattened it. But what happens when everybody comes back out in society? We get a second and a third curve. So being that counterfactual person there to what's your reason behind why you're doing these things? It's really the what happens after what happens next. And, and keeping that in mind and, and knowing you're going to have to go explain it again. So uh, Mike's right. You, you just got to get out in front of it and, and be very, very clear. Now, with um, both the Me Too movement and the social unrest as a result of the killing of George Floyd, many organizations have had to deal with uh, shortcomings and failures of chapters long before anyone who was in place arrived there. How does an organization really respond to things that happened 20 years ago, 50 years ago to a company for which there's no one that can answer for it, but they are seated in the seat of the company that has to address that. I'll let you go first on that one, Jeff. <laughs> I'll go back to uh, 
tell the truth and, and tell it very, very well. You know, there, there is accountability. And even if you weren't in charge, you know, the, the CEOs from years past, it still happened and it still happened under your brand. Um, and, and it goes back, you know, express the empathy, you know, care about people and who it impacted. You know, I mean, it might have happened a long time ago, but people still hurt. Let them know you care and, and, and then move forward and, and take a look at the, what are the lessons learned? You know, that's the other part of crisis communications is what lessons are we learning along the way that we can use in the future? And, um, you know, so some companies handle it pretty well and, and others, not so much. <laughs> And this is, again, part of this, um, you know, strategic planning. And I have news quizzes once a week in the PR class so that students are aware of these issues. And in terms of the Me Too, this probably isn't a Me Too example, but the Penn State case with Coach Sandusky, um, where he was molesting kids at a summer football camp. Penn State's going to have to live with that for many years, as they should. And, and hopefully it's going to make them have a better system when it comes to interacting with young boys um, in the community. Um, in terms of uh, the George Floyd case, um, people for years have warned about police communication. And I'll, I'll take that focus for tonight's theme. How can police be better communicators? I'm you know, not even talking about should I shoot or not shoot, but there's been a long history of this, good and bad. Um, one area that you can pivot on, of course, too, is you can look back to the founding principles of the country and say, can we build off of those as a company and use those? I mean, Martin Luther King used those to promote diversity using the Bill of Rights, using the Declaration of Independence, using Abe Lincoln and Thomas Jefferson and pivot on those and use that history um, to your advantage. So if I can do a little bit of a follow-up to that question, um, we all are gonna have failures, uh, all organizations do. Uh, can you point to a leader who has done well in apologizing and what was it about their apology that worked? Um, I can think of, there's two companies, Johnson and Johnson after the Tylenol scandal and Jack in the Box after the E. coli scandal, they both did really well. They did not say no comment, they did not deny um, Jack in the Box helped the kids in the Seattle hospitals who were dying from E. coli, and they completely changed their systems. Um, Domino's CEO, when the people were messing with the food and employees were recording that on video. Um, but I'll just have to think a little bit. Jeff, maybe you've got a leader that comes right more to mind. You know, uh, I don't have one right off the top of my head. But a story I like to tell is uh, Dr. J and Bill Clinton. I know, crazy to put the two of them together. Dr. J, a reporter out of Miami, discovered that uh, a young tennis phenom uh, playing in Wimbledon um, uh, went and found her birth certificate because she never talked about her father. And it turned out to be Julia Serving, Dr. J. And the reporter called Dr. J and Dr. J admitted it right up front, said, yep, it's, it's true, it's me. And, and gave him the story. And then he said, you've got one hour. And then he went out and did a press conference and went public with it, that he was in fact the father, that he did have an affair, uh, that he had cheated on his wife, um, but also that he'd supported girl and the mother. Um, and then you compare that with Bill Clinton. Um, I did not have sex with that young woman. And Dr. J's story lasted one day. And I think we know the rest of the history on with, uh, with Bill Clinton and being evasive on it. So I think people will excuse being human um, and making mistakes. Um, especially if you've done the right things. If you're a good guy company, if your brand is good, 
you know, if you're out doing good things, people are going to forgive you a lot faster than, than if you're a big old nasty company. And, and you look at one case, um, if I can twist your question a little bit, look at Pete Rose, greatest hitter in baseball history. He has refused to apologize for betting on baseball. And most people say as soon as he does, he's in the Hall of Fame. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, we go through a thing called the communication response model in class. And if you did it, fess up to it, um, talk about the standards and go with it. Willy Brandt, the former leader of Germany is a great example. He went to the Polish uprising memorial um, in the seventies. And without telling anybody, he dropped to his knees has have to ask for penance and forgiveness for the crimes the Germans did against the Poles. And that image really stands out as a good apology. It seems like so many leaders today uh, offer apologies without actually saying I'm sorry or really apologizing. <laughs> and is that something that's new? Is it something that now um, there's potential litigation that plays a role in that? And then maybe dovetailing with that, when do you bring legal in uh, with a potential crisis that your organization is facing? That's an interesting battle that's often fought in firms between your strategic communication folks and your lawyers. Lawyers like to say no comment, which is one of the worst things you can do in a crisis situation. Because if you're not going to comment, some investigative reporter is going to go find anonymous sources and then you're in trouble. So you need to comment. Um, as we go through the common response model, you just say, you know, did we do this? And there's legal standards, you know, did you you know, commit the murder? Did your company have bad practices at its factory that led to these deaths? Did the Minneapolis Police Department have shortcomings over the years that led to the George Floyd case, right? You can go through that. And then let's just say, yes, they did. Then are they responsible? Or is it just the individual police officer or is there? And then once you say you're responsible, then this is where the legal comes in is what are the standards of evaluation? So Penn State's standard was going to be the death penalty for football. And Penn State said, no, that's not fair to the players. And so you can see some legal issues coming in there. A whole other area we probably won't have time to talk about tonight is CEO training. CEOs and the company want to get this crisis hidden real quickly so that um, they don't have to pay any money for it. But something that's priceless is your reputation. It's really hard to put a price on your individual or your company's reputation. As Mark Twain said, I'm not mad that you lied to me. I'm just mad that I can't trust you anymore. And that's what I would tell the CEO is that it's worth some of the hassle to preserve that trust and reputation. And then the nitty gritty comes in when you're talking about standards and who's really responsible and so on. You know, and going back to the legal, uh, it's you need, in the crisis communications planning process, you need to have legal involved. I mean, they're, they're involved right at the beginning. They help you plan. And, you know, it, it, sometimes it can be really frustrating um, because they want to bottleneck everything. Um, other times you'll see that they want to be really aggressive and that can, that can put a communicator in a, in a really tight spot. But, um, but they, they do need to be a part of the team. But yeah, the not you back to the original part. The the non apology apology is, um, um, I think, one of the worst things that communicators have ever done, and and that CEOs have done. And you've, well, we see it through it with everybody. Gosh, I'm sorry if I hurt someone's feelings, <laughs> and and that 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 just doesn't fly. Um, might take them off the hook for a little bit, but it, it doesn't last long and, and the reputation is tarnished. Uh, what advice do you have? And Mike, I'm sure you share it all the time. And um, Jeff, you probably do also as an advisor, but for people who are trying to break into the PR world, and maybe it's for people who now are just ready to switch a career and they say, you know what, I think that's a, a, an area I'd like uh, to pursue. Uh, well, it's easy at a place like Augustana where we have such great job placement. We have the Student Success Center that helps with internships, but it also speaks to the value of PRSSA. These students come here and as first-year students, they're working on accounts, clients, each one of which is a relevant work experience. 
Um, and that is the advice I would give to the students. Get your hands dirty, get involved. Almost any job in PR I can think of, they're gonna to wanna to see what your background and experience is. Sport management, for example, they don't care that you want to be the director of PR for the Minnesota Twins. Everybody wants to do that, but they're going to look at your resume and say, hey, how many minor league teams have you worked for? What other experiences have you had? So get involved. I, I totally agree with that. And, and having had a lot of interns over the years, the, uh, the, the students who are involved in PRSSA um, stand out by far. Um, but, but I would also say be curious, be really curious, you know, follow the news and ask questions. Don't just absorb it, analyze it. Take a look at where, where's it going? Could that have been done better? What does this mean? How did that happen? And then find, find a company that you're passionate about or an industry you're passionate about and learn as much as you possibly can. Um, networking is not a bad thing. Um, do that, but but really being prepared as a student or, or even in a mid-career case, um, I think this would be great. Can I do it? And what's it take to do that? So, you know, I, I love the fact that I never stop learning something new every single day about PR. And I've been around the game for quite a while. So it's exciting that way. And uh, some things stay the same, but there's always different iterations, um, different scenarios, things you don't know. And uh, so be curious, be really curious. One last question for you. Um, again, crisis is something that <clears throat> we only associate with the negative. So what does success look like from a crisis communications perspective? Um, confidence. Uh, at the end of the day, having that reputation still there for you. Um, I was going to quote him earlier, but I'll quote him now. FDR, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Imagine if a leader would say that now with COVID, for example. There's so much panic and fear, but a leader who will be resolute, courageous, hopeful, confident, um, but we say PR is all about trust and relationships, reputation and relationships. So at the end of the day, is your reputation intact? And do you still have a mutually beneficial relationship? I would say those two things. And I would add to that, that you'll know it's been a success uh, with those two things, but also when you discover that clear path forward, here's where we're going tomorrow. Here's what, here's what we're gonna be next year and being confident in that but but yeah it, it's definitely what mike says is those are the two big benchmarks i use well thank you uh gentlemen thank you so much for joining us tonight and i feel like in this era in this time of crisis um realities that are happening out there i also want to say thank you to all our frontline workers first responders yep our technicians, our nurses, our doctors, and everyone who's facing COVID head on in these incredibly challenging times. You're all in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, thank you for everyone joining us tonight. I hope you have a great night. Hey man, Thanks, have a good Joel. evening. Thank you. Thanks.